Welcome back to Aerospace Engineering. Today we're going to talk about some of the forces of flight and stability. We've split this discussion into talking about center of gravity and stability on an airplane. And in a separate topic, we will discuss the idea of the forces of flight and how lift is created. So let's get started. When we talk about the forces of uh, that, that interact on an airplane in flight. Uh, what we're really looking at are two positive vectors, lift going up, thrust going forward, which are always counteracted by drag and weight. Now this is kind of an important idea when we talk about stability in flight. And we know from our discussions in earlier classes uh, the idea of static equilibrium is when all of the forces external to a body are in balance. And at that point, the body is neither accelerating nor decelerating. In other words, the net force is zero. Now that's an interesting idea because when we look at an airplane in flight, we know that lift is counteracted by weight. But one thing we always need to remember is that lift is attached perpendicular to the wings. Weight is always pulling straight down, regardless of our attitude. The other interesting idea is that thrust and drag are intimate, re, intimately related, and we will see those uh, as we move into our uh, jet engine calculations. And we'll also see the idea that the faster we go, the more drag we create. Similarly, the more lift we create, the more drag we create. So it's quite a complex interrelationship, very simple on the surface. Now when we look at an airplane, basically you got the four forces of flight. Uh, and weight is a gravitational attraction to Earth. As I mentioned, that's always pulling straight down. It does not matter what attitude the airplane is in. So if it's going straight up, the weight is still pulling straight down. If you're in a bank, the weight is pulling straight down. Now lift, that's created by the effect of airflow or the wing going through the fluid, which is the air. Now we'll discuss in a separate lesson some more of the physics of how we create lift, uh, and that'll be the focus of several of our lessons, learning about the mathematics behind that. But suffice it to say that lift always acts perpendicular to my wing plane. So if I roll into a bank, my lift is pulling me into that bank. Thrust is what's created by my engine. Uh, and it basically, it's opposing drag, but it's really accelerating my airplane forward for the most part. It's how we take off. And drag is the force that's acting in opposite of thrust. Now realize that drag has a couple of different components. We've got drag that is just caused by the airplane shape, the plan form drag. We also have an induced drag, and that induced drag is created by the movement of air as we create lift. That's called induced drag. So a couple of different components of drag which we'll learn about. So when we talk about force, what do we mean by force? And we say that a force is a vector, and that just means that it has both a uh, quantity to it as well as a direction. So that magnitude and direction are represented by arrows. Now theoretically, the bigger the arrow, the bigger the quantity or the magnitude is. The smaller the arrow, the smaller the magnitude. Rarely do people hand sketch the magnitudes accurately. So sometimes we'll use numbers on that. So the orientation of the arrows is the direction. So force one is acting to the right, force two is acting to the left. Now typically, when we discuss these, we talk about an arrow to the right being positive, an arrow to the left being negative. So which one's greater? Force one, obviously. Now if we put some numbers on these and we say that force one is 75 newtons, force two is 40 newtons, then the net force here is going to be to the east because force two is acting to the west, force one is acting to the east. Now, if we were going to say that east is positive and north is positive, we would say that it is a negative 35 newtons to the east. Now, 
That's a pretty simple idea. Now, if the two forces that apply to an object, what's going to happen is my object is going to accelerate to the right. And that comes from one of Newton's laws that says force is equal to mass times acceleration. So if my net force is non-zero on a non-zero mass, then the acceleration has to have a magnitude and a direction. In this instance, the acceleration is to the right. And when we talk about this resultant force, what we do is we're just basically taking 75 and subtracting 40 newtons, and we're drawing the vector to the right. So on this one, what's the resultant? I've got force one acting to the right, force two acting to the left. The magnitudes are equal, therefore the resultant is zero. When this is the case, the object is in static equilibrium. Now static equilibrium does not mean that the object isn't moving. What it really means is the object is not accelerating. And the analogy that I use for this is if you're driving down the road with an open container of a well, liquid, a drink, let's say you're at QT, and if you're just driving down the road at 50 miles an hour, there's no problem with the drink in the cup. It doesn't splash out. But the moment you jab on the brakes and decelerate, well, the liquid wants to keep moving. It f is f accelerated forward because the net force uh, on the cup is pushing that liquid forward. Uh, same thing if you accelerate and you took off real fast from a stoplight, that liquid would flow back out. Or if you hit a bump, the liquid would bump up in the air. Those are non-static situations. When the force is equal to zero, the net force, you're static equilibrium. So if we look at an airplane moving from position A to position B, we need some kind of a net force. And thrust is what's propelling us from A to B. Now, as we move from A to B, we have drag resisting us. Now, some of that drag, as I mentioned before, is due to the shape of the aircraft or the planform drag. Some of the drag is due to the creation of lift called induced drag. But all drag, the net drag, as shown by the blue arrow, it acts to oppose the direction of flight. Now, as we go faster, we get more drag. Ultimately, this is what determines the maximum speed of any object, is the net force of thrust being neutralized by the net force of drag. Now, if thrust and drag are equal, it means that I'm not accelerating. It doesn't mean that I'm not moving. I'm moving, though, at a constant velocity, or I could be have a constant velocity of zero. It just means I'm not accelerating. Now, if you want to increase acceleration, really there's two ways of doing it. The first way, the obvious way, is to create more thrust. The less obvious way is to decrease your drag. When we learn to fly in a simulator, we'll talk about both of those scenarios. Now the last scenario that's talked about on the screen here is we could decrease mass. Now I don't really pitch that as a viable option for most airplanes that you're going to see and experience. We don't throw passengers out the window to decrease our mass. Uh, some aircraft, and I'll give you an example, like a bomber, does accelerate when it drops its payload. A water bomber fighting a forest fire will accelerate after it drops its fire retardant. But typically, for most airplanes you'll encounter, that's not the case. We don't really decrease mass abruptly to accelerate. Now, the weight, like I mentioned, is always pulling down. It's always pulling straight down. Doesn't matter the orientation of the airplane. Now, it's pulling down at what we call the center of gravity of the aircraft. And essentially, that's the centroid of the airframe. And it's where the plane would balance if we supported it on a stick. When we talk about weight and balance now, 
we got a couple different things going on. Now the center of gravity is represented by this symbol up here where my cursor is flashing. And in a weight and balance calculation, we have to balance out both the amount of weight the airplane is being asked to lift in addition to the placement of that weight. So let's talk about that. The aircraft manufacturer has an ultimate maximum weight that the airplane can lift. That's basically how much lift can be generated by the wing. It also has a range where the center of gravity has to or where the center of gravity has to exist, and that is related to the center of lift. Now, when we talk about this, the airplane's in its flight envelope, or it's controllable inside of that range. If it's outside of the range, one of two things is going to happen. Well, one of three things, actually. I'm either too heavy to fly. I just can't get off the ground. I'm above my maximum gross weight. If the load is too far forward in the airplane, well then I'm not going to be able to rotate my nose and take off. If the load is too far aft, my airplane is going to pitch up uncontrollably. So let's talk about each one of those and how that's depicted. Now we always have to adjust and calculate uh, our center of gravity. Uh, when we perform weight and balance. So many of you may have seen uh, when you take off on an airliner that uh, one of the ground crew comes in and hands the pilot a piece of paper right before they take off. And what they're telling the pilot is the amount of weight in cargo and fuel and people, and that's estimated, that's on the airplane. That pilot is now doing some math up there to be sure that the weight and balance is within limits. There's a few other things they're getting told up there too. So when we do weight and balance, we have to have a reference point. And the reference point is arbitrary. For a light airplane, the common reference point is the firewall. And we call that the datum. And we're going to measure where our moment of rotation is relative to the firewall. And we look at the total weight and we look at the weight and where the weight is located to uh, make that calculation. So the weight that makes up an airplane is pretty simple. I've obviously got the weight of the airplane. I've got the weight of the pilots and the passengers, the weight of any cargo, and the weight of the fuel. Frequently, the weight of the fuel is the biggest weight on the airplane. Fuel is heavy, uh, about seven pounds per gallon. So it's quite heavy. Now, we're going to talk about it in terms of moments. And you remember what a moment is from our principles of engineering discussion. A moment is a force times a perpendicular distance from the point of rotation. Now, simply stated, I've got this wrench here, and my point of rotation is where my cursor is flashing. And my force is being applied at the end of the wrench. The distance is the distance from that point of rotation to where the force is acting perpendicular. So there's my line of action. My moment is a force times a distance. Now a force that we're going to talk about that reflects how much mass is in an airplane is pounds of fuel, pounds of people, pounds of the airplane. And there's that distance. That distance is the distance perpendicular to the line of action. So here's our datum at the front of the firewall. And what we can do is we can start to measure things back from that datum. And as we look at it, we put it in a chart. So we look at basically the force or the weight and then how far aft the firewall is it. So the empty weight of the airplane, 1,460 pounds, I have to start to fill in this stuff. Now when I add all my weights up, I've got 1,460 pounds of the airplane, 160 pound pilot, 180 pound co-pilot, 240 pounds of fuel, 340 pounds in the back seat, and 20 pounds of baggage. For 2,400 total pounds in that tiny little airplane. 
Now the location of this, the 37.4 inches, that's where the center of gravity is on the airplane for the empty airplane. 37.4 inches back from the firewall is where that 1,460 pounds is. The pilot happens to sit 37 inches back from the firewall. Co-pilot the same, and obviously the fuel sits in the wings and it's a little bit aft of where the pilot's sitting. And the rear seat passengers, well, they're way back here where my cursor's flashing. And the baggage is way back in the tail here. So all of these are in inches and pounds. So I get a resultant of 1460 times 37.4. That's 54,604 inch pounds. The pilot is 5920 inch pounds. Co-pilot 6660 inch pounds. Fuel 10872. The rear seat passengers 24752 and the baggage is 1898. And obviously I have zero, zero weight for the second baggage location, so it doesn't really matter. Now I add all these moments up and I get a total. 104,706 inch pounds. So I have a total gross weight of 2,400 and a total moment of 104,706. Well that's neat, but how do I apply it? And the answer is we use charts. So we're going to go back into the airplane owner's manual and determine if we can fly this airplane. And in this owner's manual we've got a chart. And in this chart I've got a couple of different zones here. So let's talk about the first zone. And the first zone is above this top line. And what this top line represents is it represents the maximum amount of lift that the airplane can create. Therefore, it also represents the maximum amount of uh, weight that I can put in the airplane, including the airplane. And it looks like it's right about 2,400 pounds. That's the maximum I could carry. Now, if my loaded airplane moment right here on the bottom side is too far forward. And notice that as I get lighter, it can go further forward. But if it's too far forward, and I'm in this region on the front of the graph right here, well, that's equally problematic. And what that shows me is that my center of gravity is too far forward for my aircraft. So I have to put more weight in the back. If the contrary situation occurs and I've got too much weight in the back, then I'm on the right hand side of this envelope and my center of gravity is too far aft. Now what's going to happen in these two cases? I mentioned it before, but if my airplane is too nose heavy, that's to the left hand side here where my cursor is flashing, when I get to flying airspeed, I won't be able to rotate. I don't have enough tail authority to lift the nose off and start to fly. This is a pretty rare occurrence to get this far forward. It's really hard to do, to be honest. Now if I'm too far aft, that's probably more common. That just means I have too much weight too far back in the airplane. The net result of that is as the airplane tries to take off, it rotates, but I can't stop it from rotating. In other words, it'll fly two nose high, it'll stall, and you'll crash. Now this just means I've got too much weight in the back of the airplane. So what's the fix for these? If I've got too much weight in the back, I need to move weight forward or get rid of weight in the back. If I've got too much weight in the front, I need to move weight backwards or get rid of the weight. So two different solutions. If we look at this, whoop, that's where we are. We're at 2,400 pounds and we're up here at about 104,000, I think 104, uh, 
1,500. So we are right on the raggedy edge of controlled flight. Now we're going to stop there and uh, our next topic will bring up this idea of what are the forces of flight. And what we're going to do now is we're going to open our center of gravity calculations and take a quick look at it. So let's take a moment and pause and download our So here you see your assignment, uh, and really what this is talking about is calculating that center of gravity. And here we have an airplane uh, depicted, and I've got several data points in here for the pilot, no co-pilot, rear seat passengers, and then the baggage and fuel. So you're going to come down here and you're going to complete this chart. Remember, you're putting the forces or the weights in this column, and then you're computing the moment by taking the force times the distance aft of the firewall. You'll sum the total forces and sum the total moment. Then you're going to find that point on this chart where it lies. From that point on the chart, you'll ask, answer the question here, and you're going to solve the problem. I'm going to give you a hint. You're not going to be within the operating limits on this first go-round. So I'm going to ask you to do the exact same mission with the exact same people and cargo and rearrange locations to get the moment and the total mass within limits. And then display your answer up here on this chart. So that's a center of gravity calculation in class. We'll look at it for larger airplanes for like a 737 manual uh, and a few others. So it's a pretty straightforward computation. Go ahead and finish that, finish the conclusion questions, and we'll turn that in. Thanks for watching.